I had a passion that was God-birthed, God-driven, and that was to become a physician and to particularly be an obstetrician. And that required a lot of uh, sacrifice and commitment. To get through a residency program uh, in OBGYN, uh, I would be working in excess of 110 hours a week. Uh, and that's just not for one week, that's really for four years. But the downside of that was I, I got so physically depleted that I ended up two years after residency having a brain aneurysm. Now the brain aneurysm wasn't caused necessarily by my hard work, but the fact that the aneurysm ruptured was. Um, and more recently, um, two years ago, I had a cardiac arrhythmia in the middle of the night uh, as I was caring for one of my patients. And I ended up being in the emergency room with IVs and, and EKG uh, being done and cardiac enzymes. And yet again, it was God telling me, hey, um, you're, 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 you're breaking my commandment again. You know, you're not getting enough rest. What I learned from that is, again, God was not just gently tapping me on the shoulder, but kind of yelling in my ear saying, hey, I'm trying to remind you again that you're not listening. You're not listening to me. And what I'm telling you is you need to have more rest. You can't continue at this pace. My uh, fantasy of being a superhero uh, came crashing down in the emergency room that night. So what I continue to do is I continue to adjust my schedule so I can continue to do what God has called me to do, but also be obedient to the command to get rest. God loves his children. He wants the best for us. He wants us to have a rhythm of rest. He wants us to have healthy lives. Uh, when I was a little kid, I was pretty wound up, had a lot of energy. That may shock you if you know me because <laughs> I'm really low key now. But uh, when I was a kid, I just, I didn't have an off switch. The, the, the term my dad used, for it's not a term used often these days anymore, but it's a great term. He would refer to me as being a bit rambunctious. Isn't that a good word, rambunctious? Look it up. Google that later. But he said, he said but when I would get, and, and he liked that about me. He liked that I was energetic. He, liked, he, he affirmed that. But when I would get too rambunctious, when I would get too wild, almost getting out of control, maybe going to hurt myself or someone else because I was going so much, he would say these words, kind of quietly but strongly in a deep voice, he would say this, Kevin, cease and desist. <laughs> cease. He gave me a cease and desist order. He said, stop. He could have just as easily said this, Kevin, Sabbath, Sabbath. That's what Sabbath means. It means to stop. It means to cease, to desist, stop doing the things we do all day, every day. We go through life and we're busy and we're moving and we're going. And God says, in the rhythm of life, along the ways you're moving quickly, he says, cease and desist, Sabbath, slow down. It's God's way of saying, rest. I made you for more than just to be a machine that works. God says, I've made you for me. I've made you for relationship. I've made you for rest and for peace. And, and we've got to learn what it means to get into this rhythm of Sabbath. God cares about our health on every level. God cares about you. He cares about your health. He cares about how, how your body is healthy, how your mind is healthy, how your spirit, how, how your soul is refreshed. God cares about these things. Like we saw in the, in the testimony with, with, with Dr. Rick Alexander, just talked about I had to have these wake-up moments to realize I'm not a machine, I'm not a superhero, I'm a person. And, and so God, in his word, in the Ten Commandments, where this is the fourth of the Ten Commandments, and so we looked at the first four of the commandments for how we relate to God, this is the final one in that group, and then we're going to look at the six Ten Commandments about how we relate to each other, to other people. But the fourth of the Ten Commandments of how we relate to God is God says, here's one of the ways you relate to me. You trust me as your heavenly Father, I made you, and I'm telling you, it's best for you to have a rhythm of rest. This is how God says it in Exodus chapter 20. If you have your Bibles, you can open Exodus 20, or you can check on your, on your tablet or on your phone if you have it opened with a Bible app. Exodus 20, beginning in verse 8. And just notice the heartbeat of what God is saying. God says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. 
Holy is to set something apart, to make it different. Remember the Sabbath day by making it different, by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. It's how we relate to him. On it you shall not do any work. Neither you, nor your son or daughter, your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. But he, God, the Almighty One, he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Oh God, you love your children. You love us. You know how we're made better than we do. And you've called us to this rhythm of rest. Speak to our hearts today. I pray that every person who's here today who's your follower or who becomes your follower will learn the wisdom of a rhythm of rest in our lives. You've called us to this as a gift. Speak to our hearts, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, why would God say to you and me, you need to rest? Why would God say cease and desist? And the answer is very simple. God made you, God made me, and he knows how we function best. He knows that we're not all powerful. He is. He knows that we can't run and run and run and not at some point crash if we don't slow down. He knows we can't pour out and pour out and pour out and keep pouring out unless we get filled up. God knows you. He made you. He loves you. He wants the best for you. And he says, there's a rhythm of rest that I've established. God established the Sabbath as a gift for his children. The Sabbath is a gift. A day of rest is a gift. Here's the problem. We look at Sabbath, God saying, out of every seven days, rest for one. We look at it as God saying this. Okay, you're making me rest. God, you're, you're putting me in the timeout chair. I don't want to be here. Don't make me, don't make me sit here. But I gotta, okay, when can I get... It's, like, it's, it's a punishment. God's going to make us rest. But, but Sabbath is not, is not like the timeout chair. I knocked my microphone off here. Um, Sabbath is not, is not that. Here's what Sabbath is. God says, I want, you, I want you once a week, once a week, not to be put in the timeout chair, but I want you to do this. Can you feel it? Can you feel it? <laughs> My wife knows if I want to, I go to sleep right now. <laughs> it's a LaCroix, relax. <laughs> Sabbath is a gift from God. We treat it like it's a punishment. We treat it, well, we don't, we don't want it. But God says, I love you, I care about you, I'm giving you this gift. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, and if you're in Exodus, just turn back to your left to Genesis a little bit. And God's, God's creating the heavens and the earth. In Genesis 2, 1 through 3, we read this. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he, God, rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Let me ask you a question. Why did God rest on the seventh day? Was he tired? Was, he just, was God just like, this is exhausting. The sun and moon and stars, heavy lifting. I just can't do anymore. Is that what's going on here? What's the answer? No, God's all powerful. God didn't, God didn't need to rest. You know, why was God resting? Let that thought just linger in the back of your mind. We'll come back to that. But you know, why, why would God rest when God doesn't get weary or tired? There's something going on here that I think we have to understand that's kind of behind the scenes. In the book of Isaiah, it's an extended passage. It's fascinating. If I, if I was preaching a two-hour sermon, I would spend about a half an hour just on this text because it's powerful. But this is what we read in Isaiah 30, verse 15. This is what the sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says. This is so beautiful. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. But look what it says next. But you would have none of it. God says, I want you to have quiet. I want you to have rest. And you said, no. You'd have none of it. 
And it goes on to talk about, you get on your horses, you race, you're, you're just doing all these things, and, and you just get this sense that, that as his people, even though God loves us and offers us this gift, we're like, no thanks, don't need it, I'm going. So we pour out and pour out and pour out and pour out and can't figure out why we're exhausted and why we're bitter and why we're cranky and why we're joyless. We give and give and work and work and work and work and we forget that we're not machines. We're children of God. And so God says, you know, I offer this to you, but you'd have none of it. And so we look at this gift that God offers and we say, no thanks. But isn't, isn't, don't all of us long for moments of rest? What, what if somebody said to you, listen, I want to do something for you. I want to build in to every week of your life a little vacation. If it was just up to you and somebody said, I, I just want to let you have a little vacation every week, what would you say? You'd be like, yeah, yeah it doesn't sound so bad. I'll take it. You take the kids for me, I'm going to go over here and rest. You take the job for me, I'm going to go over and rest. You take care of your own. But, but that a rhythm of rest is what God wants for us. God is saying, I want you to have a rhythm of life where you work hard, but you also learn to rest well. And Jesus carries the same theme through his ministry. We saw it in Genesis, we see it in Exodus. Now look at Matthew, the first book of the New Testament. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. And Jesus is speaking and he says this. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Not just physical rest, but deep in your soul, you'll find rest. And then Jesus says this, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And we don't use language of a yoke anymore, but in the ancient world, in some parts of the world today, if you have an ox and the ox is going to pull a load or pull a cart, they have a yoke that kind of lays over their shoulders. It's actually made custom for each ox because otherwise it'll chafe and create pain. But if it fits right, they can carry a great load. The point, the point is not that Jesus says you're not going to carry any load. He says it's going to fit right. I'll, I'll put on you the right amount of things. And if you don't overdo it, if you, if you rest well, you can find refreshment for your souls. That's what he wants for you and me. That's what Jesus offers. When he came to this world, when he died on the cross, when he rose again, he, he said, I bore your sin, I set you free. And I want, to, I, want, I want you to take my yoke because it's easy and the burden is light. And so God gave us an example and a model of resting. He didn't need to, but God said, I want you to see something. I want you to watch and pay attention. Like a loving parent with a child, with a child uh, th th God as our heavenly father shows us what the rhythm of life should look like. So I want to read Genesis 2, 1 through 3 again. I read it earlier, but notice what God is doing in this text. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. God created all the heavens and the earth. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested, he stopped, he ceased and desisted from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. He rested, God rested. So did God need to rest because he was physically exhausted? What's the answer? No, of course not. So what's God doing? I think what God is doing is what a good parent does. He's showing his children, us, how to live and what to do. He's modeling for us because he knows we're going to look and if we see that, okay, if God, my father, rested six days of labor, one day of rest, that's how I should live my life. Then when he gives us, gives us command, we can see it in our heavenly father. It's like a parent, it's like a dad or a mom sitting with a little baby and they've got one of the little jars of, of baby food, and it's some kind of you know, whipped you know, meat product of some sort, and it's warmed up in the microwave, and they're stirred it all up, and, and they take a spoonful, and they put it in the little baby, and the baby does the, you know, kind of fights against it. And so, so good dads and moms will sometimes do this. They'll take a scoop, and they'll say, oh, honey, honey, watch. Look at this. Look at honey. Oh. Mmm. <laughs> this is good. You know, and they're gonna go, you're gonna go, this is delicious. Oh, honey, you're gonna love this, you know. What are they doing? Do, does dad or mom need to eat pureed liver? <laughs> Probably not, right? Um, but nor does my baby, somebody said. Thank you very much. It's, it's, let's, just, <laughs> let's just join in and make it a group event. Um, so, so I said, nor does my baby. But, but you know, d d does, does dad or mom need to eat baby food? The answer is no. Why would they do that? Because they're showing their child. 
So the child will look and go, oh, that's what I do. I do, I do like daddy and mommy. And I think our heavenly father is saying, look it, I, I may not need to rest, but I'm gonna take a day of rest because I want you to look and say, my life can't just be about pouring out, pouring out, pouring out, pouring out, pouring out until at some point I'm gonna crash because I have nothing left to give. My, my life is about pouring out and being filled up and refreshed and then pouring out and being filled up and refreshed. It's a rhythm of life that makes us whole. And God is showing us this is the rhythm for you as my children because he loves us, because he wants the best for us, because he doesn't want us to crash because we never learned to rest well. And God also reminds him in Deuteronomy 5, which is another account of the giving of the law of the Ten Commandments, in Deuteronomy 5, 15, we learn that they're called to remember what joyless, restless slavery felt like. The people God's speaking to had been in slavery. They had no rest. Year after year after year, for 440 years, they didn't get to rest. So God says this in Deuteronomy 5.15. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt. Remember that you remember they were they were making you work and do the same work, making all the bricks, but then they wouldn't give you a straw, they didn't give you the, the resources you needed, and they made you create as many bricks, and it was just endless labor. It says, remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. God ties together their slavery in, your, in Egypt. And the Sabbath day. He says, remember that you were slaves. Remember what it was like. And now I'm the one who set you free. And I want you to stay free. Don't go back to Egypt. I think, I think if we work week after week after week and have no rhythm of rest in our lives, we put ourselves in bondage. We're back in Egypt again. We're slaves to our job. We're slaves to, make, slaves to making money. We're slaves to whatever it is that we have to do again and again and again with no rhythm of rest. And so God's waking us up to that and saying, I don't want that for you. I want more for you than that. And we have to understand also that work is a gift from God, and so is rest. We're called to a healthy and God-honoring rhythm. You know, work is a gift, and rest is a gift. Some people don't see work as a gift, but in the garden, in creation, when God makes this perfect paradise, God says to his people, I want you to work. Tend the garden. Keep the garden. Do work. As a matter of fact, there was labor in the garden, and there would be labor in having children. Labor and physical work, labor and having children. The words are similar, right? And then when sin comes into the world, there's pain in the labor of physical work and there's pain in the labor of bearing children. But the pain came later. In perfect paradise, God's people were working. Work is a gift from God. But work becomes a prison when we don't learn the rhythm of rest. So God says, work hard and honor me with your work and then rest well and honor me in your rest. And we get that rhythm of life that's a gift from the Lord. So Sabbath is more than a nap. You know, Sab Sabbath is more than just saying, okay, I gotta take a nap. And, and, and I, I, didn't, I grew up in, in Southern California and I didn't know almost anyone that went to church. I didn't grow up around faith stuff. I wasn't a Christian growing up and didn't grow up in, a, in, in my extended family of over 100 people, one Christian, the whole extended family. So just not, a, not a, a faithful family. So I didn't understand Sabbath or resting at all. Sunday was just a day like any other day. And, but when I moved to the Midwest, a lot of people treated Sunday as their Sabbath day. And there were rules like this. You take a nap after church. <laughs> Doesn't matter if you're four or 14 or 84. You take a nap after church. And I found that there was other things that were like these, that, that, that Sabbath had become almost like a, a bondage. So there's rules, I, I heard rules like this. Well, in our family growing up, on Sunday, you couldn't run. You could walk briskly. But you couldn't run. It's sort of like power walking and not running. It was like, that was one of the rules. I had, I had somebody say, our family was kind of liberal because uh, on Sundays on our Sabbath day, we were allowed to go to the lake. We just couldn't put our feet in the water. <laughs> what? What is that? That's like another, it's like torture, you know? But they were like, oh, you know, it was these, you can't do this. You have to take a nap. You can't, you know, Sabbath became, it became this thing that bound them in. It became a timeout chair instead of a recliner with a refreshing drink to be refreshed. And so, so God wants us to understand it's more than just taking a nap. It's more than rules and regulations. And so when we Sabbath, and I believe this, if you, if you make a decision, and it's going to be up to you, it will be up to you. If you make a decision as a follower of Jesus, or if you're not yet a Christian, if you become a Christian, if you make the decision that every week you're going to have a rhythm where you're going to slow down, you're going to try to do the best you can for 24 hours, 
to rest your body, to rest your soul, to rest your mind, to rest your emotion, to say, what, what refreshes me? What fills me up? If you decide to do this, then you're making some declarations. When you say, I will Sabbath as a rhythm of my life, you're declaring some things. Let me tell you four declarations you are making when you say, I'm going to be a person who regularly observes a day of rest. Here's one declaration. I am confident that God can run the universe without me. <laughs> Sabbath puts me and God in the proper context. When you say, I'm going to take a Sabbath, you're saying, okay, God, you made the universe, You've, you ran the world fine before I came on the scene. I think, God, you're going to be fine when I'm gone someday. So I'm going to trust you this day to kind of let go of the reins, let go of the steering wheel, and say, God, I let all the things go that wind me up, and I just have a day to be refreshed, to, to, to move at a different pace, to think about different things. God, you can handle the universe without me. Can someone say amen to that? I mean, God, God, God is really powerful. But when we Sabbath, we're declaring that. Here's another thing we declare. I have a loving father who looks out for me and knows what I need more than I do. When you Sabbath, you say, I have a heavenly father. He made me. He knows me. And my heavenly father has said to me, the best way to live your life is not become a work machine, but to work hard for up to six days a week, but one day a week to truly rest. To not pop in the office, to not check my emails, to not make a few calls, but to actually rest. And I'm declaring that I trust my father who said that's the best way for me to live. Here's a third declaration we make when we commit ourselves to a rhythm of Sabbath. I trust that God can provide all I need and, and accomplish all things in six days of labor. Sabbath invites God to amaze us with his provision. When you Sabbath, here's what you're saying. And, and for, for many people today, they're like, well, I'm working two jobs or three jobs, and I, or I'm working a job, and I'm going to school, and I'm doing it. And so I just, there's no room for any rest. I just go, 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 week after week, month after month. There's no pause in there. And, and, and when, when, we, when we do this, when we slow down, we're saying, God, in six days, you can provide what I need. And I believe this. I believe that whatever your vocation or occupation, you will do better work and ultimately, it will be more satisfying and more productive, even financially productive, when you work six days and take one day of rest and don't work seven days in a row. Why? Because when we pour out, pour out, pour out and have nothing left, we become bitter, we become exhausted, we lose focus, our mind is weary, our bodies are weary, emotionally we're discouraged. And those six days, those seven days don't produce as much as six days when we have that rhythm of rest. God made us. He knows us, and he understands the best way to live is this. And so we acknowledge that, God, by doing this, even though I'm taking a whole day off, somehow there'll be enough in the storehouses. You'll provide what I need. And I've seen God do it again and again and again. And a fourth thing that we declare when we take a Sabbath is that I can cease and life goes on. I can stop. And the whole world just continues on. It's wonderful. On my Sabbath day, I turn off my organic outreach email account. I turn off my Shoreline email account. Yes, I turn all of you off for a day. Uh, I, you know, I turn off, I've, I've, I have one account that I have feed information to me, and that's my personal family account. And you know what I've discovered? The next day after my Sabbath, all that stuff that came in, it's still waiting there. <laughs> Little elves didn't come and do it for me. It didn't disappear. The world didn't fall apart. And I can pick it up the next day. Do you know that there was a time when human beings, when they were away from other people, couldn't be reached? <laughs> how, many you, how many of you were alive at the time in human history that when you went away, no one could find you? Can I get a praise Jesus? Can I see that hand? I see that hand. Praise Yeah. I was like, yeah. It used to be like that. And can I tell you a secret? If you turn off your phone, it still is. Uh, <laughs> You can, but, but, but no, everyone needs me all the time. I, you're important. You're very, very important. I'm important. We're important to God. He loves us. But can I tell you something? You're not that important. <laughs> you know, you're not, the, the world, when we cease, the world goes on and we become better people for it for that rhythm that becomes part of our lives. This is the way God's designed us. He's made us, he knows us, he loves us. 
I learned this in a hard way in my life when our boys were about four, six, and eight years old. I was pushing hard, was doing some advanced studies, was working full time, was a husband and a dad of three, just a lot going on in my life. And we were away on vacation with our boys, and I brought work with me on vacation, already a bad sign. And one night I was working on this project that I was doing, that Sharon and I were doing with another pastor. And the pastor talked about how in his life he had blocked out like two or three nights every week that he would go home. He said, I'd do one day for a Sabbath and two or three nights where I'd go home from church and I wouldn't go back again. I wouldn't let church take over my life. And he had kind of laid out this. And I was thinking, that's a good, that's a good idea. And so I said to Sherry, just kind of off the cuff, I said, you know, I'm going to try to, I'm going to set it up where like three nights a week or so when I come back home from church for something, I won't go back again. Because I said, if I'm not careful, I could be at church every night of the week. I could be up at church seven days a week. And Sherry really gently says to me, she says, well, you are. And I really maturely said, no, I'm not, and because I'm really mature. And I, I, I got defensive. I was like, well, no, I'm not. And she goes, well, she goes, I, I think you are. I said, I don't think so. And she said, well, okay. And so I went and got my calendar to prove her wrong. <laughs> and I went back one week. I went back two weeks. I went back three weeks. Not one day, not one day that I wasn't in the office working at some point in the day. I was not Sabbathing, I didn't have a good rhythm and it was affecting me and my family. And I confessed that to my wife and I confessed that to my sons. And I stood up that next Sunday in front of my congregation and I said, I need to confess a sin in my life. So I am not following God's rhythm of rest. And I've been working too much and I, and I just shared that story with them. And the people in my church didn't get mad at me. They just said, hey, we're gonna keep you accountable. You need to rest, you need to take care of yourself. We want you to be able to serve Jesus for the long haul. And this isn't gonna... And, and, and God was able to restore things in my family, some things that I think had been damaged because of the pattern of my life. So I'm, I'm not talking about something that, and, and even today, I, I work on making this my lifestyle, but I have to battle, because here's the deal, I love my work. You may not figure this out, but I love being a pastor, I love preaching, I love teaching, I love leading, I love what God calls me to do, so I could do it all day long. But, I, but God says to me, Kevin, I know you. You need a rhythm of rest. And so, so, so if you can't get a hold of me, and it's normally for me, it's on Thursdays, you'll know that I'll turn my phone on on Friday. But that, that's, that's something I'm still learning that God is still teaching me. So a couple practical thoughts. What day should I Sabbath? Cease. Celebrate God's goodness. What's the right day? You know, the ancient Jews would Sabbath from you know, sundown Friday till sundown Saturday. The early church, many people kind of shifted to the Lord's Day, the seventh day of the week on Sunday. And, and I would say the right day is the day that, that fits the rhythm of your life. I, I, you know, for me, if you said, Kevin, you know, it's okay, for Christians, Sunday's the Sabbath. Kevin, you need to rest on Sundays. Well, I got a little rest a couple minutes ago when I sat in that chair for about 10 seconds. But um, you know, Sunday doesn't work very well for me as a day of rest. But Thursday's great. So I usually take Thursday. And if I, if I can't make it on Thursday because we have a board meeting once a month on Thursday, then I'll do it on Friday so I can get that whole day. But find the right day that works for you, a day that you can actually slow down and live at a different pace, doing different things, thinking different ways. Yeah, and I would encourage you to do your best to try to find a 24-hour chunk of time. And you go, that's impossible for me. Start somewhere. Start with two or three or four hours. And, and begin to work towards this. And you have to be creative. When our boys were little, I remember I went through this whole process and I decided I was gonna start Sabbathing. I started doing a really good job of it and I was taking a whole day off every week and my wife came to me after a few months of that. She said, I have a question. So what, honey? And she said, can I have a Sabbath too? <laughs> we have these three children and uh, I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, good point. No. And so, no, I just, <laughs> I didn't say that. I thought it, but um, there's so much we don't say, isn't it? Um, but what I, what I, what we ended up doing was, I would, we, we, took, we decided to take the same day, and a third of the day, I would do whatever I wanted. A third of the day, I'd be with the boys, she would do whatever she wanted, and a third of the day, we were together with the boys. And for a season, we did it that way. And as we go through life, we keep looking and adjusting what fits this season and what's the right thing for right now, because life changes along the way. But we've continued to, to make this a priority in our life and in our family. And what happens is we pour out a lot but one day a week, there's this little mini vacation spiritually meeting with God, sitting not in a, in the, in the timeout chair, but in a refreshing place, being filled up spiritually. And so, so the next question then becomes, what should I do or not do on my Sabbath? I mean, what, what do you do on a Sabbath? I would give a few suggestions. One, make worship an important part of your Sabbath day. So if you make Sunday your Sabbath day, being here, worshiping, encountering God in a special way among God's people, that's a great thing to do. For me on my Thursdays, 
I get more time in the morning. I don't have to, I'm not going anywhere. My normal Sabbath, if you look at my calendar, so on my calendar, if, some, if things are purple, that's my own time. Normally on, on, on my Thursday, it's purple and it just says Sabbath and there's nothing planned. That's my favorite kind of Sabbath day, nothing. And I can just go, what am I gonna do today? But in the morning, I'll spend time in prayer, spend time in the word, and I don't have anywhere to go, no work to go to, so I just linger and spend more time meeting with Jesus and I let him fill me up. Time with people that you love, that you enjoy being around, that kind of invigorates you. That's a great thing to do on your Sabbath day, on a time that you're focusing on rest. Uh, and, and then not doing what you normally do. John Calvin, this great theologian, said a Sabbath is a day where we don't do the things we normally do. So if you're, if you're in farming, if you're in ag, then I would say go into, don't, maybe don't go work in your garden if you're doing farm stuff. Maybe that's, you know, if you're a professional golfer, you say, well, I may not want to go golfing on my day off. I probably don't want to golf. And if you're a person who gets stressed out when you golf and you like yell and scream get uptight, maybe you shouldn't golf on your Sabbath or ever. Um, and so, but uh, just a pastoral suggestion. But, but to, to, what is it that I, I normally do? I set that aside to do things that I don't normally get to do. I, I had a woman in my church in Michigan. She held one of the highest elected office in the state and very high power person. And she grew up in a very strict Christian home where her family said, you can't garden on Sunday because that's work. But she worked all week long. She was driving in and out of Lansing and she was in all kinds of meetings. And she said to me, she said, I love to garden. When I get in my garden, I take my shoes up, I put my feet in there, put a little chair in there. I pull some weeds. I just, she says, but it's, it doesn't feel like, but am I allowed to do that? It doesn't feel like work to me. And I said, does it refresh your soul? She says, oh yeah. I said, does it make you feel close to Jesus? Oh yeah. Does it feel like work at all to you? No, it's not. I said, then get in the garden. Take off your shoes. Enjoy it. That's what fills her up. You, you need that rhythm. God's wanting to fill us up with his presence and his grace and, and physical rest. Do things that are different. Shut off the things that you normally do. Do things that refresh your body and your soul. I would suggest that you try disconnecting from, it's just a different kind of day, disconnect from technology. I would encourage you to think about turning off your phone, turning off your tablet. I mean, actually literally pushing the button and turning it off. So like the screen goes blank and it doesn't make any noises. Just try that. When I turn off my phone, this is it. I turn up, I hold the button, I wait, and it just does that little, goes down, and this is what I do. I just go. There's just sort of a, a different rhythm. Even if it's for a few hours, try it and see what God does to refresh your soul. But find, and find those things that truly lift you up and refresh you. The heart of God is a heart of rest. And, and God, God made work in the, in the garden in perfect paradise. You know, God, God called his people to work. God loves work, but in the rhythm of life, we need rest. And the Sabbath that God offers is not a timeout chair because we were naughty. It, it is just, it's a place to get comfortable, to say, Lord, meet with me, to connect with people that you love, to do something that's just fun and refreshing. And maybe for you, you say, man, my schedule doesn't allow that right now, but maybe I can carve out two or three hours. Start there. You will be amazed and how much God can refresh you, and then move, work toward a rhythm of rest, partner if you're in a family, partner with the other people in your family, and just, and just learn to say, God, Lord, we come together right now, just, we, we can talk to you anytime. I pray you would teach us as a people the goodness of Sabbath. Lord, this one of the 10 commandments isn't, um, isn't meant to be laborsome, it's meant to be a gift. And Jesus, we thank you for your heart we thank you that Jesus, in, in Matthew 11, you said these words. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Lord Jesus, let us find rest in you. Let us find a rhythm of rest. Let us teach it to our children and grandchildren. Let us release each other to find places of rest. Let us not harass our friends if we can't reach them for a day because they've disconnected. And Lord, fill us up each, each week. Fill us up with that time of rest so that we can then go into the rest of our week and work with enthusiasm and love people well and follow you passionately and not be cranky and grumpy and tired but to be fill, filled up with your presence. Thank you, O oh God, for the gift of Sabbath. Let us see it as that, a gift, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.